Well, before we get to this week's teaching, I want to give us a little update on They Devoted Themselves. First of all, as was our practice last summer, this summer we are taking the month of August off. Actually, a little more than that. We'll be back in the second week of September. And so if you're using these videos in your churches, you can plan for that summer break. Secondly, that also means that, yes, we are returning for a third season. I mean, why wouldn't we? These have been wonderful gifts to our community and even those beyond our community. So, yes, we will be returning again for a third season in that second week of September. And thirdly, then, that means that we need your support. Would you be able to give to support the production of these videos? Our budget is about $12,000 and we're hoping to fundraise a good portion of that. All the giving links are in the description down below. And it would be just a real wonderful thing if you could support this. So thanks so much for that. And with that, let's get into this week's teaching. God himself will provide the lamb. The story that you've just read uh, is as wonderful as it is dreadful. It's wonderful because we see on display the uh, unflinching faith of Abraham. It's staggering that he actually follows through and does what God asks him to do. We also see the gracious provision of God for Abraham and Isaac. But the story is also dreadful. It's a terrible story. It's a confounding story because of what God asks his friend Abraham to do. It's what God requires of Abraham. God commands Abraham to sacrifice his one and only son, the son of promise. And this whole request seems to place God at odds with himself. It doesn't seem consistent with the character of God. It was only the pagan nations around Abraham who committed such unthinkable crimes as child sacrifice, right? Because the gods of the pagan nations were themselves murderous deities, according to their tradition. But now, in the unsearchable mystery of God, the God of Abraham, the God of Jesus, who by nature is love through and through, he asks his friend to do the unthinkable, to offer up his own son in sacrifice. I'd like to suggest that attempting to uh, resolve such mysteries is above my pay grade. <laughs> and so we're not even going to try. In fact, theologians throughout the ages have tried to reconcile some of the great mysteries of Genesis 22, and they have failed. Soren Kierkegaard wrote a famous book on the subject of Abraham and Isaac, and he called it Fear and Trembling. Indeed. We just have to read the text, the story of the binding of Isaac, and we tremble. But what we can take away from the story is this. I think we can be pretty certain of this, that number one, God tests. Number two, Abraham trusts. And number three, God provides. God tests his people to see what their faith is worth, to see if it's real or not. Abraham trusts in the God who has already proven himself to be faithful in many, many ways. And God provides for Abraham out of the abundance of his immeasurable goodness. So let's look a little closer. Number one, God tests the faith of his people. He does this throughout the whole Bible, and he is doing it right now. Perhaps you feel like you're being tested right now. And when we pass the test by the grace of God, God says to us what he said to Abraham. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld the one thing I asked you to surrender. Hmm. 
And though we will probably never be summoned to do what God summoned Abraham to do, thankfully, we are required to trust God in the tragic loss of our children. And if we don't have any children, the tragic loss of any dream or anything at all that we may love. As God gave Isaac to Abraham and Sarah, remember in their old age, they were barren and it was a miraculous conception as they held their child of promise upon which the entire redemptive story was bound up in for the Messiah came through the line of Isaac. And then God asked Abraham and Sarah to worship him by surrendering Isaac back to him in sacrifice. We are required to do the same. Christian parents who lose children through Sickness or accidents or even suicide will tell you that when they experience such a horrific loss, they face an Abrahamic-sized decision. Will they continue to trust the God who allowed this? Or will they turn their faces away from God? And lest we dismiss the story of Abraham and Isaac as one of those weird Old Testament tales, or something that's part of the Old Covenant and not relevant to us anymore, we need to think again, because I want to remind us that Jesus makes the same demands on us as Yahweh made on Abraham. Listen to Jesus from Luke chapter 14. If anyone wants to come after me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Hmm. This was Jesus' way of saying that even our most precious gifts of family relationships are not deities. They are not gods. God will test the faith of his people. Number two, when we are, we are faced with a decision as to whether we will trust God or not. Will we surrender our most prized possessions and future hopes to him, believing that somehow God will see us through, that somehow God will provide, whether in this life or maybe in the next? This is a daily practice. You don't just surrender to God once and then it's over with. No, we surrender again and again and again. It's what Paul called the fight of faith. And I don't know about you, but I don't think there's another conversation in the entire Bible that has as much pathos as the conversation between Abraham and Isaac as they are walking up Mount Moriah. Uh, Abraham is holding the fire and Isaac has the wood for the sacrifice on his back and Isaac initiates the conversation. Father, he asks. Yes, my son, responds Abraham. The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Have we seen such faith as the faith of Abraham. Remember, he said to the two servants before him and Isaac started their way up the mountain, he said, uh, we will worship and then we will come back to you. What did Abraham have in his mind? We don't know, do we? But Hebrews 11 gives us a glimpse of what might have been going through the heart of Abraham. It says that Abraham believed that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Wow. And so Abraham trusts God, and he obeys God because he believes that somehow God, based on his character, will provide. 
God provided Isaac in the first place as a miracle son, and now God will provide through resurrection Isaac back from the dead, if indeed the death of Isaac is required. And it is here where we now see the pattern, the Old Testament pattern, of test and provision foreshadowing the gospel pattern of death and resurrection. The death of Jesus is the test that he passed, thank God, and the resurrection was the provision that was provided by his Father and the Spirit when he was raised from the dead. And for many of us in this life, the promises of God, the provision of God, will not be completely fulfilled until the new heavens and the new earth. Now, in this life, we wait and we suffer and we weep and we trust while singing with you too how long to sing this song. And number three, the text tells us that God provides. And let's let the text speak again for itself, beginning in verse nine. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The whole story points to another mountain, doesn't it? Mount Moriah points to Mount Calvary. It points to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there upon that mountain, God took the willing lamb and sacrificed him instead of us. On that mountain, the Lord provided. For the obedience that God required of us that we were unwilling to fulfill, God provided in the substitutionary life of Jesus. He lived the life that we couldn't. He is our representative. And for the punishment that we deserved for the sin and rebellion against God, God provided in the substitutionary death of Jesus. And then for the death that all of us fear, the death that plagues the human race, God provided in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I believe in Jesus, as the songwriter says. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. And I believe that he is here now standing in our midst here with the power to heal now and the grace to forgive. Can I pray for us? O oh Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, I ask for all of those who are listening to this message right now that you might open their spiritual eyes to see who you are, and what you have done for all of us on our behalf. Open our spiritual eyes, soften our hearts, and may this Sunday worship experience 
be a transforming one for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.